Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I hope a uh, rapturous virtual applause as well, because I'm we sure are coming. I'm sure, it's huge virtually. <laughs> yeah, live at you from um, the uh, Everyman at COGEX 2021. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sue Daly. I'm director of technology and innovation at Tech UK. We are actually a partner of COGEX, and we are looking after the next generation infrastructure and industry 4.0 stage at COGEX. So I'm really, really thrilled to be here and in person. This is exciting, right, Duncan? This is the first time I've seen real people for a while. <laughs> well, we, we're, we do still exist. Um, and obviously, we've got some great people in the audience. We can now wave at real people. Hi, everybody. But of course, hi. But of course, we've got people joining us virtually as well. So hello to everybody joining us virtually. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be running this session today as drones get off the ground, what the what this means for public service delivery, which is something we don't hear a lot about. So we're really going to explore the topic um, with Duncan Walker, CEO of Skyports. Hi, Duncan. Really great to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, so before we kick off, a reminder to everyone in the room and everybody watching online, um, bring your questions for Duncan, right? Um, I think he's open for a bit of Q&A. So as we go, I've obviously got some questions for Duncan, but then we'll, we'll reach out to all of you as well. But perhaps if it's okay with you, Duncan, before we kick off, we've got a short video. Sure. Um, uh, I believe in technically it's a VT. I don't know if that's how you say it anymore. Um, uh, all about Skyports and the project that we're we're kind of here to talk about. So I wonder if if the wonderful um, tech people could uh, roll the film, if if that would be possible, please. Perhaps to set the scene and kick Absolutely, it off. Absolutely, yeah. Island winds while protecting precious cargo. This is an NHS first. Drones filled with COVID tests and collecting blood samples are now being used in Scotland's most rural and isolated communities, capable of delivering directly to the doctor's door. <laughs> There's been a lot of curiosity about the drone. What about the, the community here? How have they taken to it? What are they thinking about it? People are very supportive of it, actually. I think they think that anything that would help and um, improve patient care, they're, they're on board with it. Play some cargo in the bay. With supplies dropped off, fresh samples are put in. It is ready for takeoff. An initiative launched to link up those places cut off by the rugged landscapes and choppy waters of the Hebrides. The drones are capable of an altitude up to 5,000 feet and speeds of almost 100 miles per hour. Medical samples from the islands would normally be carried by ferries depending on the weather, then on to open hospital. But this is much, much faster. What would it have been time-wise before these drones? It could be over one or two days if it was coming from one of the islands. What is it with, now? with the drones, you can get it off, off an island here within half an hour and we can turn around the result within two hours. Tests arrive in the open lab so quickly now, patients from the highlands and islands sometimes get the results even more efficiently than they would if they lived in the city. The samples can be picked up, sent across. We can have the results even before the patient arrives. Peter, here we have some COVID tests. These drones get to isolated islands quickly, but they aren't immune to the challenges of highland weather. A lot of the ferries here get cancelled. What about the drones? Do these get cancelled? Correct. Drones can also get cancelled. We have better uptime than the ferry has. Yesterday was a good example. The ferry was not going, but the drone was able to deliver. This is a pilot scheme that requires no pilots at all just someone to watch the computer screens from the back of a van. Even the helipad isn't the traditional H symbol. It's what's known as a visual landing target, a kind of QR code, and there's a special camera on board the drone that identifies this and then automatically lands itself. In a land so untouched by modern technology, the passing hours have a way of feeling insignificant. But when time-saving is life-saving, it might just make this place even more attractive. Peter Smith, News at 10, Open. What a powerful way to start and it really brings this to life, what we're talking about here, what public um, drones could mean or do mean for public service delivery. Duncan, CEO of Skyports, thank you so much for being yeah. here. Please, let's kick off. I'm really keen to hear more about Skyports your role and your work, but also your vision for the use of drones. Perhaps let's start bigger picture um, across the whole of the UK? Yeah, so um, I started the business four or five years ago now. Um, I'm a real estate guy by background. 
And originally we started uh, and still do providing physical infrastructure for passenger and cargo carrying drones. As you're getting into urban environments, moving people and goods around is hard, it's polluted, it's congested. Um, so that was the original uh, issue we were trying to solve. In order to do that, we needed to develop a whole lot of new technology, ground to air communications, ground handling, communicating with things in 4G denied environments. So bringing in local area networks, bringing in uh, satellite communications and European Space Agency have been a key part of the work we've been doing uh, recently. Um, dealing with the integration of manned and unmanned traffic. So, uh, you know, all of our drones are, are autonomous. We're sending them 40, 50 miles at a time uh, in corridors. There's a great big open sky, but but stuff happens that, that you don't expect. If it's manned traffic, we, we transmit uh, 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 ADSB it's called, which is communications telling them to there, but you know, there's hot air balloons, there's flocks of geese, so there's real time decision making that needs to be done. So, you know, where we are today is is flying thousands and thousands of kilometers up in Scotland for the National Health Service. We've flown 14,000 kilometers in the last three months, delivered 10,000 samples and testing kits. And it's a it's a great micro environment to prove the technology, to, to do the technology, particularly in a, in a world of COVID because A, there's less stuff in the sky. General aviation yeah. is much more restricted. Um, but equal, equally, there's a real public need. You know, these are underserved communities. The infrastructure is bad. It's difficult to get to places. And we're turning 36-hour journeys into 36-minute journeys. Wow. And you know, where, where that goes, we very much believe in the, in the application for drones for rural communities. Urban environment, actually, if I order something on Amazon, I can usually get it the same day. Uh, there's very sophisticated supply chains. Uh, it works pretty well, mm. uh, and of course there is a there is a case. But the the safety threshold, the public acceptance, the the, the business case isn't as good in a city centre actually as it is in a rural environment. Mm. If you think about a rural environment where you've got urgent samples, where medical um, as a great uh, starting point, but we've been delivering self reduced packages for the Royal Mail and and all sorts of different things. Um, in that environment, you can really begin to make a difference to to people. And yeah. you know, if you think of the land mass and the population, yeah, there's a lot talk about fifty percent, fifty six percent of the world lives in an urban environment. Mm. Well, forty four percent lives in a rural environment, and it's much harder to serve mm. that community with things like vital medicine in short space of time, improving those service levels. So we think there's just huge application around the UK and and then beyond into many other places. Because it's really finding ways or Perhaps we'll come on to this. Of these, this technology can really make a difference to people's everyday lives, particularly in in those those rural areas where, as you say, I mean that's incredible. Thirty six hours down to thirty six minutes. That really could change someone's life, right? Yeah, absolutely, and it's thirty six minutes seventeen times a day. So it's not a you know a freak occurrence that you happen to be on the right thirty six minutes. Yeah, it is thirty six minutes time and time and time again. And it, I'll give you one example of of what happened. So, like I said, over ten thousand samples delivered, one hundred and sorry, 14,000 kilometers flown, um, we, in doing that, saved two lives, which uh, is quite incredible, really, because actually it's a very small environment, very low population. Mm -hmm. But you know, on one, one occasion, uh, the, the van, it was a Sunday, the van had left. This is a van that does a long loop. Mm -hmm. Van wasn't coming back for another 36 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, emergency sample had been taken. The drone was ordered by the NHS online from Oban Hospital. We were there in 36 minutes. We were back in 36 minutes, so an hour and 12 minutes. The sample was in the lab, um, which is done at Oban Hospital in the pathology lab. It was analyzed within 20, 30 minutes. The doctor was administering medicine within two hours. Wow. And that medicine saved that lady's life because I, I'm not a doctor. I don't know the consequence of it, but it was pretty bad and there was a way to solve it. And, and they managed to negotiate the way to solve it and get the right application, the right medicine, the right time. Yeah. Without that service, there would have been no alternative other than air ambulance, helicopters flying back and forth, mm. um, which is, you know, by that time, it's really ugly. And aren't uh, always available. Right? Aren't always available. Don't always meet the weather criteria. If you can't see, you can't fly the helicopter. Yeah. So, you know, one one small example of, of how it can be applicable to you know, a huge range of opportunity. Yeah. This is a great conversation because what we've been talking about at Cogates and through the, the next generation infrastructure and industry 4.0 stage is around the technologies that are really going to make a difference. Um, and obviously we're talking about public sector here, but it would be good to kind of maybe get your views as I have you here, Duncan, in terms of broader kind of sectors and industries. But about it's about bringing the, this to life, right? It's about talking about the possibilities. 
So obviously drones are here, they're not science fiction, they're, they're real, they're with us, which is great. So if we're looking, perhaps before we go a bit more into public sector, if we're looking ahead and we're looking at scaling up the use of drones and the application of drones, um, particularly if we get this right, and perhaps we might you know, come on to what does getting this right mean, but where do you see, or where does Skyport see broader, you know, kind of application and use? Which which sectors, which businesses, which industries do you think could really, you know, embrace drones in, in, in this way? I mean, the, the applications are, are broad and wide. We we tend to focus on medical upfront because it's uh, high speed, high value items, right? Yeah. I, and, you know, if I've got a, a pair of trainers coming from like i can probably wait another day yeah like, i might not feel like i can but i can probably i'll yeah. be all right maybe i won't go for my evening run right. no. <laughs> but it, 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 it that's that's a brilliant use case and if you think about the, the logistics and the supply chain that with the nhs or any other healthcare network around it's huge yeah, yeah. absolutely huge yeah. so you know starting there where these things get really efficient is when you start uh using networks that you've established for multiple uses so i'll give you an example of scotland We've been flying for the National Health Service back and forth. Um, network's pretty well established. Royal Mail came along and said, well, actually, we've also got stuff to deliver um, into these environments. It may not be as urgent as the medical sample, but occasionally we're sending empty, drone one, empty drones one way to bring pathology samples mm. back the other way. There's nothing to, stick, to stop sticking a package in on the way out. So you know, we delivered something to a lighthouse. We delivered stuff to Oban. And it just drives efficiency through the network. And actually, when you get to that scale... Yeah you start reducing the price point for the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. So actually, the marginal cost of a drone delivery is very, very low. It's electricity, mm -hmm. right? But you've got a reasonable upfront cost. You've got quite a lot of humans in the loop at the moment, but you get rid of them quite quickly mm -hmm. as regulation evolves and as the technology evolves. If you can start using those drones for multiple sources of multiple times, you can start providing variable pricing. It depends yeah. how altruistic you are, but you can start providing variable pricing. Yeah. So, right, National Health Service, you, you underpin this drone network. You give us a, a revenue stream, which allows a, a sensible return. And, mm. and frankly, what, all of these things are driven by sensible return. Um, and if we can start delivering for the, for the Royal Mail, which we do, uh, if we can start doing uh, offshore wind farm inspections, again, next use case, brilliant use case, yeah. sending people in boats out there it's dangerous the sea's horrible it's costly yeah. you don't need a person out there don't do much other than operate a, a video camera mm. you can start really building efficiency into the system so you know agriculture a huge user of drones uh, medical pathology samples offshore wind farms and then we think it goes rural semi rural suburban and ultimately urban mm. personally i'm less convinced about the urban application of smaller drones mm. people absolutely yes uh, hold on the story which we're working on um larger scale cargo absolutely yes door-to-door mm -hmm. -door delivery urban environment uh, is very very difficult for that yeah so bringing it back down to um public service delivery and you're talking about the the project that you've done with nhs scotland which is fascinating you know i'd love how did that come about tell us a little bit more about that project you know did you go to them did they come to you you know because i'm interested i mean it's a fascinating use case but you know it has to come from a conversation or it has to start from somewhere tell us a little bit more about how you got to work with them yeah and it, like all of these things in retrospect it looks like it came easily and it's a natural choice but we probably spoke to 25 nhs trusts <laughs> before we got to the scottish one which actually you know some you exclude because their airspace is very challenging some yeah. you exclude because the use case isn't there or you know some you exclude because they're a very urban environment we actually we started in uh, cambridge with adam brooks oh, right. um they have two hospitals they're, they're chucking yeah. pathology samples back and forth all the time um excellent use case very hard application because you're flying over cambridge city center to get from one to the other yeah totally feasible but the safety yeah. case is you yeah. know that threshold higher in scotland we're flying over forests and locks and and uh yeah. you know un uninhabited environments yeah. The, as the technology improves, and you know, like I say, we flew all these miles, and not one safety incident touched wood, and, and the threshold is very, very high. But you want to prove it in environments where you have a margin of error. Yeah. And uh, so you know, went through all of these NHS trusts. Uh, Scottish NHS trusts actually pretty innovative. Mm. Uh, and like all of these things, we just found a champion, a mm. chap called Stephen Whitson, who's the uh, a logistics uh, and innovation person that works on the west okay. coast of Scotland. He has a real need, right? His job is to get stuff up and down a very tough environment. Yeah. 
And so once we, we met with Stephen, he, he's very forward thinking. He said, right, just come and try it. And this was, that was phase two. We did another three months yeah. last year. And um, it's, it snowballed from there. So we would go up there, frankly, met with a degree of skepticism. You know, what can this offer? Is this just a gimmick? Why from, are you here? From the staff or from, from the community? From the community, or? from the staff, from, from uh, the, the press, from, you know, from everyone. What, what's yeah. the purpose of this? Yeah. But you're asking people to judge things in the abstract. And as a company, we're, we're firm believers in, in doing stuff because it gives a frame of reference. It gives yeah. a tangible proof and point. showing what can be done. Exactly there. right. And, and so when we left after the first one, nurses and doctors who were incredibly engaged in the in the whole uh service mm. said please don't go stay we really need this <laughs> this is a this is a vital part of our supply chain and, and the rate of adoption was very very quick and yeah. you know the next stage is is get our operatives out of it mm. and get the nhs staff trained frankly it's very very easy it's it's a plug and play you plop it in and the, swap yeah. it out yeah. so there's not a huge you know except the ground the ground control station the van which uh, it's called Veronica. We missed a trick. It should be called Vanessa, but Veronica the van. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of science there, yeah. but actually at the recipient end, there's very little. It's plug and play. You drop it in, you drop it out. Yeah. Even at the van end, frankly, they're monitors rather than pilots. I mean, they're yeah. some of the most skilled. They're all 18 years old. Some of the most skilled pilots. They all come from drone racing leagues. They're incredibly talented. Yeah. They monitor systems all day long. There's yeah. not a lot of manual flight going on. I suppose that's where you want to get to, where people go, this is a no-brainer, right? And please, you know, don't leave. We need this. It's Absolutely. like, um, you know, when you get to a point where you go, well, let's just use the drone for that. It's, it just becomes commonplace. Yeah, and the community acceptance is really important. And I, and I genuinely think we would have had a very different response if we'd have been delivering trainers from Amazon compared to pathology and medical samples. Yeah. You know, there, there's drones coming in. They're remarkably quiet. There's not a lot of nuisance associated with them, but there's the perception of noise and nuisance, yeah. which is worse than, than the reality. And because they saw very quickly the beneficial effects on the community, yeah, it, incredibly difficult to have anything but a positive reaction to that. Yeah. So they went from being quite skeptical and cautious to being champions themselves. Well, I mean, you saw it on the video. Yeah. No one, no one was paid there. No one was. No one needed to be there. The, the doctors at, at, at Eastdale Medical Practice, yeah. which is a tiny little medical practice, right on the on the bottom tip of, of the west coast of Scotland, love it. I mean, hugely engaged on it because it's doing something meaningful. Yeah, and it's making a difference to them as well as their patients. So, okay, so so I was about to say, so you've done it. Tick in the box. Obviously, it's not a tick in the box, right? But you know, you've shown what can be done. You've shown the power of it, and um, you know it, how it can really make a difference. Uh, what are your kind of um, key learnings key takeaways from the project you know if someone's sitting in this room or online somewhere around the world watching this going okay well we want to do something similar w what would be your advice to them call us don't try it <laughs> it's really hard um your numbers yeah. down coming yeah. up on the bottom of the screen somewhere um no it also there's 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 sort of three there's three areas to, to what we're dealing with here right one is uh technology yeah. And the technology is nascent. This is new stuff. We are constantly solving very difficult challenges. And it's constantly, is it still evolving? Constantly it evolving. evolving. And it's a function of regulation back, back and back and forth between the technology, detect and avoid on board a small drone like that yeah. is incredibly difficult because radars and LIDARs are heavy. Yeah. If you're putting heavy radars and LIDARs on drone, you're getting rid of payload. Therefore, it becomes less useful. So yeah. uh, you know, first bucket is technology. It's very difficult to get it right. So we are we are at the front end. We're leading some of that. You know, European Space Agency funding us to put satellite communications on our drone because that's a, a way of having yeah. what we call redundant communications. If four G fails, you've got Satcom. Yeah. Um, how do you integrate manned and unmanned airspace? Incredibly difficult uh, when you have vehicles doing random things like air ambulance, mm. uh, like the Coast Guard, both mm. of which uh, we had incursions into our airspace because they got they a problem. Might have to. They don't care, right? Yeah. They're not interested in a in a drone moving about, they've got to go and save someone at sea, boom, they're out there. And that yeah. is, uh, that requires uh, a lot of foresight and a lot of technology. So you've got the technology challenges. You've got the um, regulatory challenges. Mm. And in some environments, this is straightforward and some is very difficult. And, and what it basically comes down to is uh, the degree to which it is required to communicate. Mm. In the UK, in the US general aviation community, so enthusiasts flying little Cessnas for fun at the weekend, absolutely no requirement whatsoever to have a transponder on board that machine. Mm. Their only requirement is to be able to see. 
Yeah. Right. So if you can see, you can deal with what's out there. You can avoid a flock of birds. You can avoid the helicopter because you can because see they're it. They're flying low enough. They're flying low enough, and they're flying in good enough conditions. If you know they're not they're not instrument rated, so they're not flying in cloud conditions. Right. So if you've got a helicopter coming at you at 100 miles an hour, you're going to be able you're to going to know it. about it. Yeah. Uh, and so you can you can manage that uh, you can manage that environment pretty well. It, it, in some places, particularly the Middle East, there is a mandate that says if you are a flying machine, you have a transponder on full stop, mm. and the consequence of not is mm. severe. Mm. Here we're dealing with a, a, a legacy and a, hi a historic freedom, right? And, and then you go to the, the, the general aviation community and say, by the way, everybody, you've got to put a transponder on your glider or your hot air balloon or your Cessna. And they say, bugger off, because they've done it for 50 years. Why, yeah. you know, why, why, why? Because technology is changing. You know, this is their, this is their liberty. This is their civil, civil freedom. And, right. and, 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 you know, there's, that's right. You can't just say hard luck. This is the way technology is going. Mm. So then you've got the, the degree of conspicuity. So it makes some places easier than others. If you haven't got it on third party vehicles you basically have to take the burden onto your own vehicle and make sure you are acting as if you are manned aviation mm. so you've got real time decision making on an autonomous vehicle that's just hard right mm. what are the rules who takes priority yeah what happens if there's a yeah you know there's there's always the, the sort of the automotive one is easier if there's a yeah. if there's a mother and a kid or the, a the trolley businessman problem. you know they call it the you, trolley, yeah the trolley problem exactly so who, who do you kill first and so it, it, all of that kind of work that has to go on. So yeah. you, you basically, you know, there's there's technology interfacing with regulation all the time. How's this evolving? And then thirdly, there's the social acceptance piece of it. Yeah. You know, it's some places it is more socially acceptable because there is a requirement or there are less people. Yeah. In other places, less so. You know, if we're flying over Wandsworth Prison, yeah. more people are upset than yeah. if we're flying over a rural environment delivering pathology yeah. samples. Yeah. So... Would you say they're the kind of key barriers, the challenges to the UK? You know, I, I mentioned the, the kind of phrase before, getting it, getting it right. If there was a kind of, you know, you talk about some of the regulatory, regulatory challenges and some of the challenges around what is still an evolving yep. um, piece of technology, let's face it, uh, and some of the kind of trust and confidence issues, if I may say, about that. Are there any other barriers or challenges in terms of that you see um, the UK getting it right? And before I kind of open the floor up for questions. So if you you um got a question or you'd like to ask Duncan a question, go ahead. I know we've got um, a couple online as well. Yeah, but... of course. So the, uh, look, the, we're actually not bad in the UK at, at the regulatory piece. So we're somewhat ahead of the US um, on, on this particular topic, which oh, is right. which is good. We're somewhat is, is that, behind. Sorry, can I ask, is that because we're... It just because of the scale? Because we're smaller? No, or is it... uh, it's just because of the rate that... This is just rule adoption, right? It just they happen to have slightly more severe rules than we have because of legacy. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, there's a pathway in both environments to go in a certain direction, but it, we're not a million miles ahead. But we have slightly greater degrees of freedom and different ways of doing it than they do in the US at the moment. Okay. Uh, Singapore, where we do a lot of work in some environments, is slightly easier again. In other environments, much harder. So there's a lot of military control of the airspace in Singapore. Mm. Ship to shore is marginally easier than doing it within the city. Um, you know, Africa, much easier because there's much less dense use of sky, frankly, because the requirement is much higher. Mm. You know, there's a company called Zipline flying thousands of kilometers, doing a phenomenal job delivering COVID vaccines right now. Wow. And um, so the tolerance for... Uh, and they've had, they've got an incredible safety record, but but the tolerance for potential downsides mm. is much higher because they don't have an alternative ground based network. They don't have, and, and it's much less densely populated, yeah. right? So you you're really unlucky if something goes wrong and you have a consequence on the ground. Yeah. You know, if it crashes on the ground in a field, who cares? Yeah. That's a lost yeah. drone. But if you crash in a school, that's a bit worse. Um, so you know, actually, we're we're all right, but it it, it requires. Uh, regulatory progress in an environment where not everybody is supporting you all of the time and that causes regulators brain ache right mm. you know are you protecting the GA community are you promoting technology development in the UK are yeah. you protecting the airspace ultimately their requirement is for safety and nothing else yeah and, and so there's always that sort of push and pull but attention backwards and forwards mm, we found them pretty supportive actually particularly as a result of COVID so the civil aviation had a man uh, authority had a mandate 
to prioritize COVID related projects as soon as COVID hit. Yeah. One you know, out of a million bad things, one small good thing yeah. is that, that, that helped yeah. progress in the right way. So I would say conservative, which is what you want from regulatory authority. Yeah. Uh, but certainly engaged and certainly quite forward thinking. Yeah. But they're, you know, I always say that oh, they should be helping us a bit more. That's actually not true. Their, their job is to be sort of democratic amongst everybody. Yeah. And, well, we found them okay. Yeah. Regulation is never as quick as you want it to be. No, and 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 never easy, right? No. Um, but really important um, part of getting getting this right. Absolutely. And um, I think you're right. During the pandemic, of course, we've seen the innovative uses of a lot of different technologies. Um, the one that springs to mind, of course, is 3D printing. And really, you know, that's that particularly, particularly with PPE, kind of, it showed the possibility of it. The ventilator project showed the possibility of different industry, um, industry 4.0 technologies coming together and working together. And this seems to be also a, 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 a demonstration of the power of these technologies if, if we're willing and perhaps to say brave enough to embrace them and, and think about the future. It's a and really to bring that together. Time. Our drone is 3D printed. That that drone's an Australian drone. And wow! When, when bits go wrong, we stick it on the printer, and it comes off a new wing and stick it in. That's Brilliant. incredible. Well, look at that. Um, fascinating, Duncan. Thank you so much for walking us through that. Sure. Um, we've got some time for some questions, so um, I'm just going to uh, reach from my iPad because uh, I think we have a question here. Although I now realise that I've not brought, brought my glasses because I'll read them to myself. In, if in, the, like. in the old, well, I have to now be like an old woman. <laughs> um, how do you make your, uh, this is a question, how do you make your drones autonomous? You mentioned that at, at the beginning. Uh, is there a, a deep reinforced learning or other other AI techniques that are being applied there? That's a really great question. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And there's there's a number of steps on the way, right? So a lot of people when they're talking about autonomous drones, and frankly, I'm slightly guilty of this, are actually talking about automatic drones. So there's okay. a big difference between an automatic drone. So you've got a manually piloted drone, you fly it around, I do that very badly. They don't let me know any of the equipment. <laughs> you have an automatic drone, uh, which is following a pre-programmed route right. and doesn't deviate. Next stage is you have a uh, an automatic drone following a pre-programmed route with a number of variables that it can cope with. If there is an airspace incursion two miles away, there's a so diversion. It can, divert, it can go to and... eggs or it can loiter or it can come return to base. Okay. And so our, our drone and where drones are at the moment is is in that. They have a degree of autonomy so that they're taking sensor information and making real-time decisions based on that sensor information i'll give you an easy one to conceive about wind wind right. on the ground very different to wind in the air yeah if it says it's 12 knots on the ground it's probably 24 knots in the air there is very little way of predicting that okay you've yeah. got wind models so you can have a good guess at it but on all of our drones there are wind sensors that uh, have a uh, uh, have a have a threshold and if you exceed that threshold for more than two seconds that drone makes a decision and that decision is do i carry on regardless, yeah. do I deviate to my nearest safe landing point, which is yeah. pre-programmed along the way, do I return to home? Mm. So there are degrees of uh, uh, self-decision-making, degrees yeah. of autonomy. Getting to full autonomy yeah. is uh, something that we do in testing. So we have we have testing drones that we, that have full autonomy that haven't been deployed into the, the real world yet. And there you're dealing with the same, same functionality as on cars, so you're dealing with largely detect and avoid. Yeah, it, it, it's slightly more complicated because you you're, you're aggregating a lot of data inbound, mm. making decisions based on that. So you've got ADSB, you've got farm, you've got you know where other stuff is mm. that is transmitting, and then whatever you can see. Mm. Now, if you think about uh, a drone, you need to have a pretty good one eighty degree vision like line of sight. That's sometimes called yeah, it. or radar. So it doesn't you don't literally be able to see it, but you need to be able to sense it. Yeah, and and so then you're putting a lot more of the decision-making burden onto the drone itself. You know, if there is a flock of birds coming head on, yeah. are you going up, down, left, or right? Yeah. And that's a function of not only what that flock of birds is doing, so you're trying to predict a path of flock of birds, <laughs> difficult, but it's also a function of what's hanging out on your right and what's hanging out on your left. Yeah. And and so that's sort of the that's where the tech and the regs collide, right? So you want you want rules that say every time something is approaching you head on, turn left. Mm. Because Otherwise, and this is what it happens in aviation all the time, TCAS and MCAS, that is your real-time decision making on an aircraft, pilots not making that decision. If you are head on with an aircraft, you are turning left. Yeah, right? That's yeah. the rules of the road. So that's that's where this industry is right now, which is the, culminate, the, the combination of regs and real-time decision making on board drones. Wow. And I suppose from a, if you think about the traditional kind of aviation industry, 
they came at, at what we have now over you know decades and decades and decades. Is it fair to say that you you and your industry is doing this at lightning speed? I mean, yes, uh, there's definitely definitely a lot a lot of experience we've taken, right? So you're not yeah. you're not setting on a pathway that nothing's ever been flown in the you're air. Not starting so, from scratch completely. It, yeah. Exactly. So the 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 principles of aviation are there and have been well founded, and they've made a lot of mistakes, and that's manifested yeah. in rulemaking that is now very very robust, the safest form of travel by by yeah. miles and miles and miles and miles. Um, and and so that's great because you don't reinvent everything. You, you start from there. Where we're pushing the boundaries is that exact earlier question, the degree of autonomy. Yeah. Because actually, whilst a transatlantic flight, the pilot is is more of a systems monitor than someone that is moving a machine and, and mm. turning left and turning turning right. Uh, you know, when you take that systems monitor off board mm. and do it out of Veronica the van, or you do it from, uh, you know, I can fly that drone from my desk in London if the drone's in Scotland, doesn't yeah. really matter where I am. Yeah. That's the sort of the cutting edge, that's the thresholds that we're talking yeah. about. And that's where there's not that much precedent. So you've got to be yeah. some more iterative, but it is happening a lot faster than it ever has. It's a fascinating industry to be in. It's really exciting. And also, I've been talking the last, you know, day and a half, nearly two days now about, again, that convergence of different technologies to the fact that it's a bit of 3D printing, a bit of all, all Autonomous bit of AI, bit of yeah. you know data analytics in real time, really brings. Yeah, no one's no one's inventing a new radar to do this or a new lidar to yeah. do this. You take it off automotive, you take it off of existing aviation. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of precedent, and then there's a lot of gubbins in the middle to yeah. make it all talk to each other. Gubbins. That's Very technical. technical yeah, term, yeah. technical. Um, does anybody have any questions in the room for Duncan? Oh, I've got two questions. Uh, so the uh, gentleman, I'm going to do my David Dimbleby impression. The gentleman in the white shirt, and then the gentleman in the the black t-shirt, I think. So, uh, gentlemen, the white shirt star. You, you, you quickly touched uh, uh, at the end on like local, national differences in regulation of drones and flights. Do you see there being a movement towards like a scalable, universal regulatory system? Um, and if so, how do you think we could uh, we would move? Yeah, it's a really good question. So. To some degree, you have that. So Federal Aviation Authority, uh, or Federal Aviation Administration, actually, in the US, you've got 50 member states, and there's ubiquitous rulemaking there. With the European Air Safety Agency, you have 27 member states. And uh, the, the approach they have is that there is, uh, call it federal level rulemaking, and then national level rulemaking. So you have a set of guidance, and then you have specific requirements for the geographic conditions, or you know, Sweden has a different set of climatic conditions to Italy, for example. Um, but the, the principles of the sky are there. You then have uh, bilateral arrangements with the two big authorities. So globally, they are the two big boys. They're, they're the ones that, that sort of have uh, rulemaking precedent that, that a lot of other people adopt. So uh, Singapore has a very strong relationship with the European Air Safety Agency. Uh, Australia and, and the US are very highly aligned. If you get regulation in one, it's generally pretty translatable to the other. So if Boeing get a certified aircraft in the US, you can then go fly that in Europe with very limited uh, interface. So we're beginning to see it. Um, there are always specific local requirements, which are, which are important for, for various reasons because there's different topology, topography, climate. Um, so generally, yes, and that's very helpful. Great. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it sort of, it depends on the environment. That's a good example because uh, high high need, relatively lightweight, real time, real demand, time, exactly. Yeah. So a really good example. It depends on the supply chain logistics of where you are. If you can get that from a courier in an hour, frankly, we're not really helping very much. Uh, I'll give you a a similar example. We're working um, uh, in Asia with some shipping companies. Ninety eight thousand super tankers around the world. Uh, they have. Uh, a, a policy which is called hurry and wait. You get to the port as quick as you can, then you sit there for 24 hours waiting for your slot. It's very inefficient, but that's the way global shipping industry works. Whilst those uh, ships are sitting on anchor out outside the dock, because you don't bring it into the marina until it's ready to load or unload, uh, there are a number of things that can be done which accelerate its journey in the dock. And uh, that, that involves um, waybills and, and paperwork and cash for the crew and medicine for the crew and mm. uh, dockets and all sorts of things. At the moment, it costs uh, $150 an hour to get a rib out of the ship. And there's lots of people involved in, in quite an uh, unfriendly environment. You know, there's bad weather. There's all sorts of stuff happening. 
And that's a brilliant use case there. Mm-hmm. So akin to the high need, business case closes well uh, quickly, environments difficult to operate in. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do see it as forming part of the sort of more traditional supply chain, like replacing the chip on a computer. But there's a number of peripheral business cases and, and use cases that, that sort of accelerate towards that area. Mm. So it, it could, I think, is, is the solution. Um, I, I, we're running very quickly out of time, but I have a question here around um, drones being able to communicate with other drones. So are your drones communicating with other drones and can they work therefore in concert? Can they work together? Yep, so- uh, absolutely they can. So um, they know exactly where everyone else is and, and, and they transpond where they are. Yeah. Um, and and that's not bespoke to our drones. We know where other ones are as well. Uh, there is no requirement to transpond from your drone, which makes it slightly complicated. Yeah. So if people are being complicit, yeah. we know where they are, they know where we are, it's all happening in real time. If people are being non-complicit, which doesn't necessarily mean rogue, yeah, then it's harder. Yeah. You you can see that happening in real time. So you see the the, the Dubai do a, a drone light show. Yeah, I mean that is drones talking to each other in real time. So they're following pre-programmed routes, but they know where they are relative to everybody else. Yeah. Um, it would make our life a lot easier if that was mandated for everybody, because you then have. It's called strategic and tactical deconfliction. You, mm. you plan to deconflict, i.e., you know where something's going, don't hit it. Mm. But then there is a, 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 a body in the sky that is doing something that is not as planned. Yeah. So you tactically deconflict. You turn left when it turns left. Yeah. And that happens. So, yes, is the answer. Wow. Well, look, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to. I know we've got some hands up in the room. Sorry. Um, I really want to carry on, but I think Cogex will kill me if I do. Um, so I'm afraid we're going to have to bring the session to a, a close. Um, but on behalf of myself and Techie Kate and Cogex, Duncan, thank you so much for being with Absolute us. Pleasure. And Thanks for having me. Really exploring what this drones mean for public service delivery, but really bringing it, I'm sure everyone in the audience would agree, really brought it to life. And this is clearly a, a key technology that we need to be embracing and we need to be encouraging more use of in, in the UK. So thank you for all your work that you're doing My to pleasure. help with that. And Please, can we virtually and in the room uh, give Duncan a round of applause? That was brilliant. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.